string girdling Earth. As most people know, Earth is round. Obviously, it's not a perfect ball. In fact, it bulges out slightly at the equator due to centrifugal force. But let's imagine Earth as a perfect ball for a thought experiment. Stretch a piece of string along the entire equator of Earth so that it loops back on itself and hugs, or girdles, the ground perfectly. Now, lift the entire string so that it's exactly one meter off the ground, and add extra string so that it's still a closed loop. How much extra string is needed? One's gut instinct may be to assume that it would be several kilometers at least, but this is incorrect. Let's actually work out the math. Our perfect ball Earth has a certain radius, meaning the distance from the center to any point on the surface. At the start of this scenario, the string forms a perfect circle around Earth with the same radius. If we lift the whole string up one meter and extend it so it still connects, the result is another perfect circle, this time with the radius being one meter bigger. Let's see how increasing the radius of a circle affects its circumference. We will use tau, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its radius, about 6.28, and equal to 2 times pi. A circle's circumference is tau times the radius. A circle with a radius of 1 meter has a circumference of tau meters, about 6.28 meters. For a radius of 2 meters, the circumference is 2 tau meters. A 3 meter radius yields a 3 tau meter circumference. In general, increasing the radius by 1 meter increases the circumference by tau meters. The circumference is a constant multiple of, and therefore proportional to, the radius. So, no matter the radius of Earth, lifting the string by 1 meter causes a length increase of tau meters, or about 6.28 meters. We can also prove it algebraically like this. Thus, in order to lift the whole string up 1 meter, you would need to add about 6.28 meters of string. Coin Rotation Paradox Take two identical coins, A and B. Hold coin A in place and place coin B against it. Then roll coin B around coin A, without any slipping, for a full cycle. How many full rotations or turns do you see coin B make? This is something you can try at home. Perhaps surprisingly, coin B actually makes two turns during the round trip. To understand this, let's examine a simpler scenario, rolling coin B along a flat surface. For simplicity, we'll assume that each coin has a radius of 1 centimeter. For the rolling, we will track the point on the edge of coin B that starts out touching the surface, and when that point returns to touching the surface, we'll stop rolling. As coin B completes its roll, its center travels a distance equal to the coin's circumference, which is tau centimeters about 6.28 centimeters. The total rotation of coin B is one turn, or tau radians, if you prefer. Now let's return to rolling coin B around coin A. Once again, we will track the point on the edge of coin B that starts out touching the surface, which is the edge of coin A here. Then, when that point returns to touching the surface, we'll stop rolling. As coin B completes a cycle, the center of coin B traces out a circle. This circle's radius is the sum of the radii of the coins, which is 2 centimeters. Accordingly, its circumference is 2 tau centimeters. In other words, coin B travels twice as far in this example as it did in the previous example, still while only rolling without slipping. Thus, coin B must have rotated twice as much, having therefore made two turns. Another option is to view the rotation as the combination of two effects. If, instead of rolling, you imagine sliding coin B around coin A while keeping a constant point of contact on coin B, then coin B will rotate by one turn. Alternatively, if you imagine flattening out coin A and then having coin B roll across it, then coin B will rotate by one turn. Combining these two effects, one turn plus one turn is two turns, which is how many turns coin B made. Don't worry if you can't grasp this problem, Apparently, neither could the writers of a college admissions test. On May 1st, 1982, the SAT had a multiple choice question regarding this problem, where every single option was wrong. Three students wrote in about the error, and the tests were subsequently regraded. Staircase Paradox Given a square's side length, its diagonal length can be calculated using the Pythagorean theorem. For instance, a side length of 1 gives a diagonal length of square root of 2 
about 1.414. But what if we try another way? Approximate the diagonal using a zigzagging staircase pattern, alternating between going horizontally and vertically. The total length of the horizontal portions is 1, and the total length of the vertical portions is also 1. So the total length of the staircase is 2. If we draw staircases with smaller and smaller steps, each staircase is still two units long. Since the sequence of staircases gets arbitrarily close to the diagonal as you go further along the sequence, we say that the diagonal is the limit of the sequence of staircases. Similarly, since each staircase length in the sequence is 2, the limit of the sequence of staircase lengths is 2. But does that mean that the length of the diagonal is 2? No, it doesn't. While it is tempting to assume that the length of the limit of the staircases is equal to the limit of the lengths of the staircases, this is actually false. The problem is the direction of travel along each curve. If you travel along the actual diagonal, then your direction of travel remains constant. However, if you travel along one of the staircase paths, then your direction of travel jumps between directly up and directly right over and over again. No matter how small the steps on the staircase, even though the staircases get closer and closer to the diagonal, the direction of travel along the staircases never gets any closer to the direction of travel along the diagonal. Well, that's the basic idea anyway. A rigorous justification requires vector calculus, which is hard to explain in a few minutes. As it turns out, finding the arc length of a curve by approximating it with little line segments connected by vertices is valid in some cases. You just have to make sure that all of the vertices lie on the curve, unlike with the staircases. Such an approximation is the idea behind our usual formal definitions of arc length. Ultimately, the staircase paradox serves as a reminder to be careful when constructing mathematical definitions. If you're intrigued by mind-bending geometry paradoxes and want to dive deeper into the world of mathematics, then a great place to start is Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform that emphasizes hands-on learning, hosting thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Learn concepts starting from first principles and building your way up, with an interactive approach shown to be six times as effective as lecture videos. Brilliant's Vector course teaches you about vectors, which are a key mathematical tool Tool for describing position, motion, and orientation. Learn the fundamentals of vector operations and use your knowledge to program your own game. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash thoughtthrill or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Sphere Eversion. In differential topology, the standard embedding f from s squared to r cubed allows a regular homotopy of immersions ft from s squared to r cubed such that f0 equals f and f1 equals negative f. More simply, imagine a sphere made of a stretchy, bendy sheet material. This material can go through itself, but you cannot tear this material or poke holes in it, and you cannot create a crease or sharp bend in the material, or it will be destroyed. The goal is to turn the sphere inside out, known as everting the sphere. At first glance, since the material can pass through itself, this may seem easy to do by just pushing the two hemispheres through each other. However, this creates a crease around the equator, destroying the sphere. You may try some other approaches, but in fact, it turns out to be very difficult to come up with a practical method. Perhaps counterintuitively, though, the task is indeed possible. This fact was first proven by American mathematician Stephen Smale in 1957. Practical methods for everting the sphere would later be developed by several other mathematicians, such as American mathematician Arnold S. Shapiro and French mathematician Bernard Morin, the latter of whom was blind. Perhaps the most well-known method is Thurston's corrugations, named after American mathematician William Thurston. It involves dividing the sphere into guide strips, making the parts in between bulge into corrugations, pushing the caps through each other, turning each one a half turn in opposite directions, and pushing the strips through the center of the sphere. This was famously illustrated in the 1994 educational video Outside In, developed at the former Geometry Center of the University of Minnesota. Banach-Tarski Paradox can you split an object into parts, and then use just those parts to construct two identical copies of the original object? In the real world, no. 
Not to our knowledge. But in the world of math, assuming certain rules, the answer is yes. The bonnach tarski paradox, proven by Polish mathematician Stefan Bonnach and Polish-American mathematician Alfred Tarski, states that a ball can be decomposed into at least five parts that can then be shuffled around to form two balls identical to the original. Additionally, for any two reasonable solids, either one can be chopped up and rearranged into the other. This theorem is often illustrated with a P and the Sun, and therefore called the P and the Sun paradox. In order for this theorem to be true, our axioms, or pre-assumed facts, must be carefully chosen. In particular, this theorem relies on the axiom of choice. This axiom essentially states that if you have a collection of sets, where a set is basically a collection of objects, then there is a way to select one element from each set. This fact cannot be proven from the other usual axioms, so it must be assumed as its own axiom. Unfortunately, the proof of this fact is very dense, lengthy, and hard to understand intuitively. However, it essentially involves decomposing a ball into a bunch of infinite scatterings of points, which are not measurable by volume. Using simple rigid transformations then allows us to snap these pieces back together into two balls, completing the process. 